Well, I promised you some history, and that's what we're going to, going to do today. Let me begin with a very important passage which has been frequently quoted by Marx, not from Das Kapital. It's actually a, a quotation from the preface of a book called A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, which Marx published in 1859, seven years before he published Capital. Here's the proposition. No social order disappears before all of the productive forces for which there is room in it have been developed, and new higher relations of production never appear before the material components of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society. That image in the womb of the old society is frequently quoted. This is a very important insight by Marx, and it sets him against the other socialists writing in the 19th century, like Proudhon and Fourier and Saint-Simon. What Marx is saying is that the movement from one form of social organization, like feudalism or slavery or capitalism, to another form does not take place suddenly because of a political revolution or because of a decision by some one person. It takes place slowly and it develops in the old order. The elements of it develop in the old order until a time comes when the newly developing forms of production, the social relations of production as he calls them, are so powerful and are so in conflict with the law and the politics, the religion, the philosophy of the old order, that there's a rupture and the new order breaks out and takes over. And that, Marx thinks, is what happened when capitalism took the place of feudalism. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen because of the French Revolution. It didn't happen because of the English Revolution. It took centuries. And Marx spends a lot of time talking about that process. This is one of the ways in which Marx's study of history enriched and deepened his analysis of economic organization in ways that nobody before him had done. It is also one of the ways in which he establishes or argues for the proposition that capitalism is not simply the ultimate rationality of human productive activity, but is one form of organization whose place can be taken by another form growing within the womb of the capitalist order. Now, Marx says, spends almost no time talking about how that growth is going to take place in the transition from capitalism to socialism. But in my very last lecture, I will actually talk about that. And I will argue that what has been happening since Marx died is that within capitalism, there has been developing new forms of social organization of production which set the stage for socialism. Now that might sound optimistic if you're like, like me, a socialist, but I will conclude my talk, alas, by explaining why we have no very good reason to expect socialism to arrive. And that will turn out to be, in a sense, because Marx got some big things wrong along with all the things he got right. But that will be in my last lecture. That, in effect, I will wrap this series of lectures up by talking about the future, however grim it may seem to be. Now, let me talk about the process of the slow transformation of feudalism into early capitalism of the sort that Marx was looking at. Starting perhaps in the 12th century, all the way back in the Middle Ages, there was in Western Europe a process of slow, steady, century after century inflation, monetary inflation. In the period of the Middle Ages, there was very little money in circulation. And an interesting fact, which, you, which may strike you as, as fascinating, it does me, about half of the gold that was actually circulating in Europe during the Middle Ages came from the mines of West Africa. And it was money, it was gold that had been traded by the rulers in West Africa for, among other things, particular forms of cloth that they very much favored, which came from, among other places, northern England. So that there was a structure of trade that actually united not only England and France and Germany and the Low Countries and Italy with 
the northern part of the Mediterranean all the way across the Mediterranean and the Indian Sea to China, but also included Africa. It was a, an elaborate network of trade. But there was a very little money circulating in northern Europe. It was mostly an economy in kind. And the labor services that the serfs were required to, to give to their lords did not take the form of money. They took, took the form of spending a certain amount, number of days each week working on the lord's land. This slow inflation was started by the reopening of the Mediterranean to trade. The Mediterranean had been closed by the expansion of Islam in the 7th and 8th and 9th centuries. And when the Mediterranean was reopened to trade, in part because of the Crusades, money began to circulate, prices began to rise. And what happened was that the lords in the Low Countries, in France, in England, although they owned the land, were what is called land poor. That is to say, they had the land, but they didn't have much any money to speak of with which they could buy luxury goods being traded along the merchants' trade routes. And so a slow process took place whereby the labor services of the peasants were converted into money rents. And if you've seen the old, I'm old enough to remember these movies when they came out, the old Technicolor movies of Robin Hood and his merry band in England, they would go around. These poor peasants would be paying their few little copper coins, and they were dirt poor. And then Robin Hood and his band in Sherwood Forest, you will recall, would rob some knight, some king's representative who was carrying, <coughs> carrying the rents to, to the king. And he would rob, take from the poor and give, take from the rich and give to the poor, as the saying went. Well, then there was a further influx of inflation when the New World was discovered at the end of the 15th century, because gold and silver started flooding into northern Europe. And as you might expect, this caused inflation, which again created a problem for the lords. So that they attempted to convert their lab the labor services of their serfs into money payments or rents, which would then give them some money that they could use to spend for the things they wanted. All of this changed the character of work for the peasants. Then a further development took place that created, in effect, a surplus peasantry. What happened was that there was a demand for woolen cloth. Wool comes from sheep, as I'm sure you all know. And so it became profitable for the landowners to drive the peasants off the lands, to enclose the lands, that is, to put fences around it. And through this enclosure process, as it was called, create pasture land for sheep, because the wool from the sheep paid better than the very small uh, labor services or rents paid by the peasants. The peasants were driven off the land, had no place to go. So they wandered along the roads into the cities. And there began to develop a large population of desperately poor former peasants who were eager to find some kind of work. Little by little, over a period of centuries, this created the possibility for what eventually became the urban proletariat in the, seven, in the 18th and 19th centuries. That is to say, propertyless workers who had nothing to sell but their labor. We've already seen how that works out in the theory of the labor theory of value. But you have to think about the historical process that created this population of workers. They weren't, they, didn't, they weren't just dropped from the sky. They were driven off the land and headed for the, for the cities in a desperate effort to find some kind of work. Eventually, there was, as, as factories developed and as this urban proletariat grew, working under terrible working conditions for miserably long hours and pitiful wages. There were a series of efforts in Parliament to do something about ameliorating the condition of these workers. A series of parliamentary acts were passed. In 
One in particular that's quite important was the establishment in 1833 of a group of government officials called parliamentary factory inspectors. These were government officials, men all of them, who went around the country inspecting factories, going into the factories, interviewing the workers, and writing semi-annual reports of their investigations in an attempt to find out both what the conditions were of the workers and also whether the employers were obeying the laws that Parliament was passing, limiting the number of hours and in some ways limiting the harshness of the working conditions. The most famous of these factory inspectors was a man named Leonard Horner, who was appointed in 1833. And if you read Marx's Capital, Volume 1, and look at the footnotes carefully, you will discover that again and again in his description of the working day, in his description of the factory system, he quotes the reports of Leonard Horner. Marx, as I've already told you, spent a long time in the British Museum reading voluminously everything he could lay his hands on about the history and the development of capitalism. And one of the things that he read was these factory inspectors' reports. Now, if you're curious about them, I will just tell you that Irish University Press brought out a series of publications of British parliamentary papers, which is, if you can believe it, a thousand volumes long. And it concerns not only the factory inspectors' reports, but all, all sorts of other things, anything which was the subject of a parliamentary study. And this thousand volume uh, collection is a simply invaluable source of information about 17th and 18th century England. Uh, I think it's online, or portions of it are online. I think that the factory inspector's reports run to something like 33 volumes. And I've actually sat down and read some of them. They're fascinating. They give you a, a feel of what life was like in the factories and for these workers that nothing else can possibly can. And it's what Marx steeped, his, steeped himself in over years of study. Uh, now, there's obviously a very great deal that can be said about this. I can't begin to describe it all, but I will spend some time talking about one particular trade in order to give you a feel for it. Let me start by reminding you of the passage at the very end of chapter 9. Chapter 10 is the working day, is, is called the working day. But let me remind you of this passage, which I've read to you before. Marx says at the end of chapter 9, the sum of the necessary labor and the surplus labor i.e. of the periods of time during which the workman replaces the value of his labor power and produces the surplus value, this sum constitutes the actual time during which he works, i.e. the working day. That's, the, la that's the, the last words of chapter 9, and chapter 10 is called the working day. And now he starts. And let me begin by reading a a passage from the very beginning of chapter 10. Marx says, what is a working day? And here is his answer. At all events, less than a natural day. By how much? The capitalist has his own views of this ultima tool, the necessary limit of the working day. As capitalist, he is only capital personified. His soul is the soul of capital. But capital has one single life impulse, the tendency to create value and surplus value, to make, its constant, to make its constant factor, the means of production, absorb the greatest possible amount of surplus labor, and in that way, to get a profit. Capital is dead lab labor that vampire-like only lives by sucking living labor, and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. Nobody writes like Marx, I tell you. The time during which the laborer works is the time during which the capitalist consumes the labor power he has purchased of him. If the laborer consumes his disposable time for himself, he robs the capitalist. That's the way the capitalist thinks about it. Any time that the worker is not actually working for the capitalist, he's robbing the capitalist of the labor power that the capitalist purchased. 
The capitalist then takes his stand on the law of the exchange of commodities. He, like all other buyers, seeks to get the greatest possible benefit out of the use value of his commodity. Suddenly, the voice of the laborer, which has been stifled in the storm and stress of the process of production, rises. The commodity that I have sold to you differs from the crowd of other commodities in that its use creates value, and a value greater than its own. That is why you bought it. That which on your side appears a spontaneous expansion of capital is on mine extra expenditure of labor power. How did this work in practice? Well, we get from Leonard Horner some description of what goes on actually in the mills. Note, by the way, since I have talked so much about the mystification that Marx introduces into his description of commodities and capital capitalism, that now the mystification has been dissolved. The mists have lifted. This is the reality of the cave, not the appearance in the sunlit marketplace. This is what really goes on in capitalism. Let me read to you a long passage, which, which is partially a quotation from Leonard Horner, in which you will get some sense of the detail with which he talks about this. What's important is not the numbers which Marx goes through. What's important is what's happening, namely the attempt by the capitalists to get as much labor as they can out of the workers, the struggle of the workers against this, the effort by parliament to control the amount of labor that laborers are required to hand to turn over, and the efforts by capitalists to get around that, to squeeze extra labor out of the workers. Now remember something which is of vital importance. Marx is not saying that, ca that capital makes a profit only when it manages to squeeze extra labor out of the workers. If the capitalist only manages to get from the worker the amount of labor that he contracted for in the marketplace, he will still make a profit. But since he is endlessly seeking to make a greater profit, on top of what he contracted for, he tries every device that he can think of to squeeze extra labor. Here's this long passage. The Factory Act of 1850, now in force 1867, Marx says, allows for the average working day 10 hours, i.e. for the first five days, 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., including one half an hour for breakfast and an hour for dinner, and thus leaving 10 and a half working hours, and eight hours for Saturday from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., of which one and a half an hour is subtracted for breakfast. 60 working hours are left, 10 and a half for each of the first five days, seven and a half for the last. Certain guardians of these laws are appointed, factory inspectors, directly under the Home Secretary, whose reports are published half yearly by order of parliament. They give regular and official statistics of the capitalist greed for surplus labor. Let us listen for a moment to the factory inspectors. Here's a quote from Leonard Horner. Quote, the fraudulent mill owner begins work a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, before 6 a.m. That is to say, he's supposed to start his factory running at 6 a.m., but he makes the workers come in at a quarter of six. He leaves off a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, after 6 p.m. He takes five minutes from the beginning and from the end of the half hour nominally allowed for breakfast, and 10 minutes at the beginning and end of the hour nominally allowed for dinner. He works for a quarter of an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, after 2 p.m. on Saturday. And then he has a long thing which figures out that he makes 340 minutes extra each week. Five hours and 40 minutes weekly, which multiplied by 50 working weeks in the year, is equal to 27 working days. Five minutes a day's increased work multiplied by weeks are equal to two and a half days of produce in the year. An additional hour a day gained by small installments before 6 a.m., after 6 p.m., and at the beginning and end of the times nominally fixed for meals is nearly equivalent to working 13 months in the year. These are the tricks by which the capitalist and this is not speculative. This is a description by the factory inspectors who went into the factories and interviewed the workers, a description of what happens in the regular course of events to squeeze a little extra time out. These sorts of things are still happening. Remember, 
even in the land of the free and the home of the brave, even in the sunlit marketplace where everything is equality and freedom and Bentham, the same workers who nowadays have the ballot and can vote into office or out of office anyone they choose, when they walk into the factory, can't go to the bathroom without getting permission from the owner as though they were children in school having to get a bathroom pass before they could leave the class and go to the bathroom. That's the way these factories functioned, and it's the way many of them still do function. Now, Marx draws on an extraordinarily broad array of documents to describe the awful conditions in the mills. I'll read you another passage. I want, to, I want you to get a feel for what this was like. In the, in the manufacture of paper hangings, the coarser sorts are printed by machine, the finer by hand, block printing. You notice that Marx actually took the time to learn up things like this. The most active business months are from the beginning of October to the end of April. During this time, the work goes on fast and furious from int without intermission from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or further into the night. Jay Leach states, last winter, six out of 19 girls were away from ill health at one time from overwork. I have to bawl at them to keep them awake. W. Duffy says, these are capitalists. I have seen when the children could none of them keep their eyes open <coughs> for the work. Indeed, none of us could. Jay Lightborn says, we worked last winter till nine in the evening and the winter before till 10. This is a, a worker. I used to cry with, oh, he's 13 years old. I used to cry with sore feet every winter, every night last winter. G. Abston, that boy of mine when he was seven years old, I used to carry him on my back to and fro through the snow and he used to have 16 hours a day. I have often knelt down to feed him as he stood by the machine, for he could not leave it or stop. These were the working conditions that Marx was looking at and that he was describing. What I want to do <coughs> is to now do something a little bit odd. Rather than read a bunch of passages, I want to take as an example one production process, an iconic production process, the production of woolen cloth which, as I'm sure many of you know, was centrally important to the English economy. And what I want to do is to describe the series of stages by which what started out as a craft production requiring a variety of skills that took long time to master and which were in control of the worker, little by little turned into machine production in which the workers had no control and almost no skill. Let's start at the beginning. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this process. You s woolen cloth is made from wool, which is, comes from sheep. You, you tend the sheep. The sheep grow long, thick coats. You shear the sheep. That is to say, you cut the, you've all seen this in movies, surely. You cut the, the wool off of the sheep. It doesn't hurt the sheep. That just takes their coat off. It's like taking a heavy coat off a dog for the summertime. You now have masses of, of wool. And there's now a long process that takes place before that wool becomes cloth. First, you wash and dry the wool. But even after you've washed it and dried it, it is not ready to be woven into cloth. First, what you have to do is turn that wool into woolen thread. And that is difficult because the wool is it's a lot of fibers that are complicatedly mixed together and tangled together in ways which are very difficult to disentangle. So the first thing you have to do is to card the wool. You take two carding bats. These are two pieces of wood that have enormous numbers of little nails driven through them. So that when you take these two bats and you take some wool, you, you take the wool between the bats and you go this way and that way with it and the nails catch on the fibers and begin to sort them out so that they're all running in the same direction. I should explain that I know about this because 70 years ago, when I was a 14-year-old teenager, my parents sent me to a eight-week eight sleepaway uh, left-wing camp in the Berkshires 
called Shaker Village Work Camp. It was on the site of an old Shaker Village. This was a camp started by two old lefties, uh, Sybil and Jerry Count, right after the Second World War, because they thought that upper, upper middle class left wing parents in Philadelphia or New York or New Haven would want their kids to have a work experience. So off we went to this camp. And in addition to folk singing and folk dancing and swimming and, and playing tennis, we spent four hours a day working. You paid a lot of money so you could send your kids someplace to work. <laughs> and well, you have to have been there to understand why. And one of the things we learned how to do was to use a spinning wheel, which I'll describe in a minute. It's a lot of fun. We didn't actually do weaving. We just spun wool into, into, into thread. But I learned how to card wool. So you take this and you, you go like this with it until you have, until the threads are all sorted out in the same direction. Then you go to a spinning wheel. Now, if you've ever seen a spinning wheel or a picture of a spinning wheel, you've probably never seen a spinning wheel unless you went to a museum. It's got a great big wheel and a very little wheel attached by a belt. And if you think about it, mechanical advantage, when you turn the big wheel slowly, the little wheel turns very fast. Coming out from the middle of the little wheel is a spindle. And the spindle turns very, very fast because it is rotating once each time this turns around. So here you've got this spinning wheel. And you take the carded wool. And this takes a lot of skill. It took a while to learn how to do this at all. But you, you, let, you get the wool to catch on the spindle. And then as you turn the wheel slowly, you smoothly draw the carded wool out. And what happens is the spindle twists, and it twists the fibers into a, tightly, uh, in, into a tight twist of a thread. You are actually creating a thread. Now, it's hard to do. It's easy to do if you want lumpy thread. But if you really want smooth thread, smooth, thin thread, it, you've got to get You've got to make these two things work exactly at the right speed and, smooth and draw it out. Then when you get finished with the carded wool, you, you, you turn the wheel and it, ro it, it, it rolls up on the spindle. Then you get some more carded wool and you attach it. You take it in your fingers and you attach it to the end of the thread that you've already made. And you, you keep doing this until you have a, a whole spindle with a whole lot of thread on it. And if you get really good at it, which takes a long time, what you're producing is really strong, thin thread. If you go too fast, the thread breaks. If you go too slowly, it gets lumpy. But if you go just at the right speed, you get a whole lot of thread. You then take the thread off the spindle and put it on what it's what is called, you slip it onto what's called a bobbin. And the bobbin is connected to a shuttle. Now you go to your to your to your loom. And a loom is a wooden structure that has a parallel series of threads on it, which are called the warp. And what you do is you pass the shuttle up, 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 down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the way across. That's called the woof. That's where warp and woof comes from, by the way. And when you get all the way over to one side, then you go back on the other side, and you keep going. Now, on a really good, and you make cloth, on a really good loom, you can have a foot treadle. The, Half of the, every, every, every other warp thread is connected to one piece of wood, and the others are connected to another. And when you press your foot on, a, on the treadle, they open up so you can throw the shuttle through. You don't have to go like this. You can have what's called a flying shuttle that goes right through. Then when you get to the other side, you hit it and it goes the other way, and you go back and back and forth and back and forth. Then after a while, you reach up and you draw down uh, a piece of wood that tamps down and gets the threads that have been woven tight with one another. And if you keep doing this, what started out as sh wool on a sheep ends up a piece of woolen cloth. That's how you make woolen cloth. And that's how, for, for centuries, peasants had made woolen cloth. They tend the sheep, they shear the sheep, they wash and dry the wool, they card the wool, they spin the wool into thread. They weave the thread into cloth. That's the whole process. Now that, and, and then the cloth is fit to be cut and sewed and made into clothing, which can be worn. That's how you make woolen clothing. 
It's also how you make cotton clothing. It's how you make linen clothing. Linen comes from flax, by the way. But let's leave it just with wool, since that was the iconic English product. Now, a process began early on in the 15th and 16th centuries that transformed this activity. This was an activity, let me emphasize, this was an activity that was required tools. You had to have a spinning wheel, you had to have cotton, you had to have the, the carding bats, you had to have the loom, you had to have the shuttle and the, the bobbin, and required a wide array of skills which it took a long time to acquire. The workers had their tools, they had the skills, and they were therefore capable of engaging in production. And little by little by little, all of this was taken from them by the development of capitalism. The first thing that happened was that entrepreneurs, capitalists, started using what was called a putting out system. They would buy the wool, they would take it to the cottages where the peasants would receive the wool, the peasants would clean it, uh, card it, spin it, weave it, and then the entrepreneur would come back, collect it up and take it and pay them some money. They still had their own tools, they had their own skills, but no longer were they in charge of what was happening. Now, of course, what happened was the longer and harder they worked, the more money they would get. And so there was tremendous pressure on them from the entrepreneurs to accept more wool and turn it into more cloth because the more cloth the capitalist got, the more money he would make. After a while, now this was a very, this was a very arduous process. These were not peasants who were all living in one high-rise apartment building in the middle of a modern city. They were spread out all over the countryside. So it was, a law, it was a complicated and tiresome business to go from cottage to cottage to cottage as each, uh, to, connect, to, to give each different cottage the wool and then to collect up the cloth. So what happened was that the workers the entrepreneurs decided to bring the workers together into a building, a factory. Factory is just an English word from the Latin that means a place where you make something. And they were going to be engaging in manufacturing, which manufacturing just means making things by hand. That's all the, it's just English for the Latin of making things by hand. Same skills, same tools, but now in, uh, in, in a single place. And at this point, there was invented something called the spinning jenny, which was not steam driven or anything like that, but it was a complicated uh, device which enabled one person to manage eight spindles at the same time. Well, you can see where this is going. This was obviously much more efficient, but it meant that there was less demand for labor. What's more, and this is crucial to Marx's story, Instead of doing all the different jobs that were involved in a complex way, putting down one job, taking up another job, using different muzzles, using different skills, regulating the activity by your own natural inner dynamic, now what happened was that the activity by what's called the division of labor was parceled out among different workers. One group of workers did nothing but spinning. Another group of workers did nothing but weaving. Now, of course, at this point, by, partly by calculation, partly by trial and error, the capitalists discovered how to balance things so that there weren't bottlenecks. So you didn't have spinners producing too much thread and then having to sit around until the weavers finished weaving it. Or weavers who wove everything and had to sit around until the spinners got around to producing enough thread. By balancing the number of spinners and the number of weavers and so forth, you could keep the factory going at maximum speed and efficiency. But of course, when it goes at maximum speed and efficiency, what that means is that no longer is it possible for a weaver or a spinner to stop and relax, to change function, to take a break. Because if you take a break, you get a bottleneck. You, there's, you have interrupted the process of of producing the thread and handing it over to the weavers who are producing the cloth which is then handed off to be to be dyed and so forth and then to be sold. 
So now what you began to have was a situation in which workers were losing the skills. They'd already lost control of, the, of their tools, of their machinery. Now they were losing control of their skills because instead of having the many different skills involved in making woolen cloth, you had people whose only skill was spinning, another group whose only skill was weaving. That was still a highly skilled uh, craft and good weavers were in demand. But now the final step occurs. In the 18th century, the steam engines were hooked up to machinery, to, to spinning jennies, and were hooked up to looms. And now the labor was being done mostly by the machine, which meant that instead of skilled workers, young children could be machine tenders. And, what, and so the, the workers desperate for, for enough food to stay alive would start sending their children into the factories to work because the capitalist didn't need a skilled spinner or a skilled weaver anymore. The, the, the factory owner n simply needed somebody to tend the machines. So what from a distance an economist might think was a great advance, namely the introduction of machinery, from the point of view of the workers meant a loss of skills, a loss of control, a routinization of the labor process so that the workers, in an ironically speaking, more and more began to deliver up abstract socially necessary labor instead of the wide variety of skilled activities that previously they had been engaging in. And all of this is, in, is detailed by Marx over many, many, many pages. This is the process by which capitalism emerged from, from feudalism. And the story I've just told you, talking about something I know a little bit about, namely spinning and weaving, could be duplicated a dozen times, two dozen, three dozen times over in every different branch of industrial production. And indeed, Marx spends hundreds of pages describing this because it is part of what transforms feudalism into capitalism. What is lost by this? Well, I think it's clear what is lost. What is gained is an enormous increase in output. What is lost is the worker's mystery, mastery of the entire array of skills involved in the transformation of nature. What is lost is workers' control of the labor process. And of course, what is lost is ownership of the product of labor. It's fascinating to see the transformation. If you take a look simply at traditional English family names, I don't know whether you've ever reflected on how many of, of the traditional English family names are actually the names of different crafts. Farmer, Taylor, Miller, Smith, Cartwright, Arkwright, Shearer. These are, peop these are people's names, but they are the names of crafts that had for generations and indeed for centuries been passed down from family to family, from, from parents to children. The names are preserved, the names are preserved as the names of people, but the crafts are lost. Now, Marx tries very hard to, Marx tries very hard to give a factual account of this, but it is clear that he feels very bitterly about it. I'll just read you a passage to give you an idea of how he felt. He says, it takes centuries ere the free laborer, thanks to the development of capitalist production, agrees, i.e. is compelled by social conditions, to sell the whole of his ac active life, his very capacity for work, for the price of the excess, for the, for the price of the necessaries of life, his birthright for a mess of pottage. Of course, an Old Testament reference. Now, the very first, in my very first lecture, you may recall, I talked about what Marx had to say in those early papers he wrote when he was only 26 years old. The Economic Philosophic Manuscripts, they're called, or the Paris Manuscripts, because he wrote them in Paris. 
And you will recall that evocative passage that I read to you where Marx says that for the worker in, in a capitalist society, when he is home at home, he is not at work, and when he is at work, he is not at home. That's a description of a factory worker. It is not a description of a, craft, of a craftsman or craftswoman. Those who are practicing these crafts in a full and rich way feel themselves to be at home when they are practicing their craft. When a, when a weaver sits down at a loom, the weaver doesn't think, now I'm no longer at home, now I'm at work. The weaver thinks, oh, finally I'm done with my chores, I can do what I really want to do, I can weave. <laughs> Nowadays, of course, lots of upper middle class young people who rebel against capitalism take up what we used to call in the old days a hippie lifestyle. Now I'm sure it has other names. But it is a kind of, a, a kind of specialty revival of, of these old crafts. So you get people making artisanal bread or artisanal honey. Not the honey that's made in a big factory which cranks out hundreds of thousands of jars, but honey that's carefully crafted by a honey maker or bread that's carefully made by a bread maker. That's very nice, but it has nothing to do with the functioning of capitalism. It's, it's just something on the side. It's a way to keep people happy so they don't rebel. It, and it's a way to serve the carriage trade, as it used to be called. Now it would be called the Lexus trade, I suppose. <laughs> that is to say, People, I mean, when you go, for example, we're now in Chapel Hill, for, the, for those of you watching this on YouTube who have no idea where this lecture is coming from. It's actually coming from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. There is a little town next to Chapel Hill, which is where all the lefties go to live. It's called Carborough. And in Carborough, every Saturday, there's a farmer's market. Well, what is a farmer's market? It's a place where you can pay too much for things that you could otherwise get in the supermarket. But you fool yourself into thinking that what you're getting is handcrafted something or other. And you walk around and there are all these other upper middle class types from the University of North Carolina and, and its affiliates who pretend that what they're doing is living the old fashioned lifestyle. But it has, uh, farmer's markets are very pleasant and I'm sure everybody enjoys them if you can afford to, to shop there. If you can't, you go to Walmart or you go to Food Lion or you go to Stop and Shop or you go to Big Y or any of the other supermarket chains where you get essentially the same food but at much lower prices. But when you go to a farmer's market, what you are getting is a romantic evocation of something that died more than a century ago. And what Marx is telling you is what really happened and how it died. Well, that will produce, I'm sure, a flood of comments on YouTube from people who protest against this outrageous statement that I've made, but that's all right. Finally, Marx draws to a close the extended exposition that he has begun all these pages earlier. And I want to read you the last lines of the chapter called The Working Day. Here it is. It must be acknowledged, says Marx, that our laborer comes out of the process of production other than he entered. Do you remember I described how he entered? He entered, you remember, he, he comes out of the, the sunlit marketplace and follows the capitalist into the factory hanging his head and expecting nothing but a hiding, as Marx says. Well, he comes out of the factory. We're now here not talking about a single individual, but a whole class of individuals. Not a single factory, but the whole factory system. It must be acknowledged that our laborer comes out of the process of production other than he entered. In the market, he stood as owner of the commodity labor power, face to face with other owners of commodities, dealer against dealer. The contract by which he sold to the capitalist his labor power proved, so to say, in black and white, that he disposed of himself freely. The bargain concluded, it is discovered that he was no free agent, 
that the time for which he is free to sell his labor power is the time for which he is forced to sell it. That in fact the vampire will not lose its hold on him so long as there is a muscle, a nerve, a drop of blood to be exploited. For protection against the serpent of their agonies, the laborers must put their heads together and as a class compel the passing of a law, an all-powerful social barrier that shall present, prevent the very workers from selling by voluntary contract with capital themselves and their families into slavery and death. In place of the pompous catalog of the inalienable rights of man comes the modest Magna Carta of a legally limited working day, which shall make clear when the time which the worker sells is ended and when his own begins. And Marx then ends with a famous tagline from Virgil's Aeneid, quantum mutatis ab illo. Now, Look what Marx is telling us. The worker all that time before entered into this contract, a skilled worker with his own tools, her own tools, with the ability to transform nature in such a way as to make it meet human needs and desires, to work in a way that is productive and fulfilling, just as Marx said in the economic manuscripts of 1844. But what has happened is, that little by little, capitalism has stolen all of that from the workers, so that they are left with nothing else but an attempt to limit the damage by getting together politically and getting parliament to pass a 10 hours, work, a 10 hours bill that will limit the amount of time that they can be compelled to work in this inhuman fashion. It doesn't make the work any more humane. It doesn't recapture the skills that they have lost. It does not give them any control or ownership over the means of production. It simply limits the amount of damage that capitalism can do to them. And that, limited as it is, is the most they can realistically hope for within a capitalist order so that the worker who enters standing tall, not just as the seller of something called labor power, but as someone historically with skills, with control over the labor process, with the ability to make the world, trans transform the world in ways that will meet his or her needs and those of their children and others in society, is now reduced to, com to trying desperately to hold off the capitalist and to create a space outside of the factory in which something resembling life can continue. This is what Marx means. The tagline I told you about is from the Aeneid. It is a character in the underworld who is describing the famous hero Hector, who in life was a vigorous warrior, a hero, a great figure in the Greek period of that time. But now in the underworld, having been killed in the war, is reduced to a shadow of himself. And so Marx ends this chapter by saying, as Aeneid did, how changed he is from before, this worker quantum mutatis ab illo.